Well, good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Quite a second half last week, wasn't it? Yeah, everybody left at halftime. Oh, this game's over. As usual, we could, hmm, had you a little scared, didn't we? We get you again in five weeks, or four weeks now. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Great game Thursday night, too, by the way. Just had to put it out there. But, hey, I had no rooting interest, as, as you can imagine. The Ravens used to be my team, and the Steelers, like, I, I was praying for a tie. Like, scoreless tie. I don't know. But Colorado, who's the new Steelers fan in my home, was very happy last Sunday. He was always a Steelers fan. He had a really good time with me last week. So, thank you to everyone who made the chili cook-off and everything work so well last week. One thing that we learned is that the Rogers are the first family of chili, um, considering they took the top three spots in the chili cook-off. So if you need any chili ideas, find someone with the last name of Rogers, and they can hook you up. So a um, few announcements. The first one is to the youth group and their parents. Tonight is our kickoff of the youth group for this year. Um, bring everybody out. It doesn't matter. Bring younger siblings, grandparents. It doesn't matter. As many people that come out is good. We're going to talk about what youth group's going to look like this year. We're changing a couple things, nothing major. But um, come out, we're going to have some snacks, some food. We're going to have some fun together and talk about what youth group is going to look like this year. Next Sunday, we're going to the Irons Mill Farmstead Corn Maze. Um, it, the cost is $8.95 unless you're over 60 or under 2. Then it's free. We're going to have some lunch here at the church before we go, and then we will head out. It is really, really cool. If the weather is good, please come out. It's, it's a fun afternoon. There's a lot of things to do there. It's a really beautiful place. So please come out and have some fun with us. Get lost in the corn maze. Um, whatever you do, do not go with me in the corn maze. I'm terrible at that stuff. If I, 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 I'll admit this. Terry and I generally cheat in the corn maze and just kind of make our way out. We get about halfway through and get lost. So don't follow us around. That would be bad news. But please sign up today in Gabbard Hall if you're going to come out to that next Sunday. Ladies, the women's Bible study begins tomorrow at 6.30 down in the rec center. And men... Your Bible study starts this Thursday at 6.30 in the rec center. Going to be starting a seven-week study on 1 Thessalonians. And last, nominating committee, we are meeting today, correct? Correct. We're meeting today in room 117 following worship. We will see you there. That's it for me. Let's worship God.
Would you please stand if you're able? Responsive call of worship that's printed in your bulletin and also up here on the board. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. Let us worship God. have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let us now in humility confess our sin and our need for God's mercy in our lives by praying together the unison prayer of confession which is printed in your bulletin. Gracious God, you call us a faithful living, yet sin prevents us from following your intentions. We pursue our own goals, worship our own gods, and place our hope in things that cannot last. Forgive the times that we have been proud of our achievements and fail to boast in your works. Give us the faith to follow where you lead us 
and do your will. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue your own prayer for confession in silence. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. God has called us to live as brothers and sisters. Let us now share the peace of Christ with one another. You may be seated and the children may come down for their time. Come on, Jojo. Have you guys had a good week? Good week? Yes? All right. How many of you, when you're walking around our church, when you were just passing the peace, shaking your friends' and family's hands, know who gives the strongest handshakes? Do you know? Who gives strong handshakes? Emily, I do this you do. You go crazy with people's hands. All right, okay. Little Emily goes by. All right, Emma, who gives really strong handshakes? Maggie, your sister, yes. Maggie, what do you think? Um. Who does? Claire does. Cole. She me down. Yeah, you get knocked down. There's something about that time. It's a fun time of sharing a moment with each other. Now, in the worship service, it's special because we've said before God, we're sorry in a very deep way. And then our liturgist, Mr. Jonathan, did a great job today, assures us of our pardon, which means God says, you're forgiven. And so it's out of joy that we go around our sanctuary and shake one another's hands. Thank goodness. And it's literally a thank God moment after we've been forgiven. That's one way of showing strength. Do you know another way of, of seeing strength at your school or in your neighborhoods? Are there big, strong people? Who are the strongest people at your school? Do you know? Yeah, football players? Yeah, and the Shannox players are doing really well right now, aren't they? All right. Jocks, right? Big muscular guys. Uh-huh. Who else is strong? 
Yes, God is strong. Today we're going to hear about the difference between how we see strength and the way that God sees strength. It's kind of a combination of those two things we've talked about. Out of joy, when you're shaking one another's hands, you are strongly interacting with and encouraging one another, like Emily does and many of you. And it's out of a grateful heart that we become strong. But also, we have to be careful because sometimes we just look at the big physically strong guys and think that that is the only way to understand or to talk about strength. Now, some of those big, strong guys, because believe it or not, I was about 30 pounds heavier in uh, high school and college. I used to play football and baseball. Uh, some of them love Jesus a lot. There's Fellowship of Christian Athletes and InterVarsity, which does fantastic ministries with big, strong guys. But not all of them are strong in the Lord. They're just physically strong. So we have to look and learn to look like God does on hearts. So sometimes you might get pushed around, unfortunately, at school. Does the strong boy or girl respond by hitting them back or by stepping back? What, is the, what does God want you to do? If someone pushes you or bullies you, do you hit back or do you step back? You do. Yes, it's actually a strong thing that says, whoa, hold on, this is not And so, we step back, and we allow there to be a little pause in our thinking, and then we don't retaliate because then we get in a lot of trouble, and we can't think very clearly. Strength and weakness, it's something that we're even dealing with right now. <laughs> it's from the time we're very little to the time we're all the way to the grave. We have to think about what God wants us to do and how he sees our strength. Let's pray together. Holy God, thank you for these wonderful kids full of energy. As they grow and are encouraged by us, we pray that we'd be good examples of strength, that even if we don't have physical strength, that we'd have spiritual strength, and that if you've gifted us with the ability to have physical strength, that we'd also develop spiritual strength so that we would be good models for our children, for our friends, our families, our neighbors, and all those who need to know of what it means to be strong in you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for coming up, guys. Did you want me to hold on to this? Okay. with me, please. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be opened. Amen. This morning's Old Testament lesson is Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. It can be found on page 810 of your pew Bible or on the screen behind me, if you'd follow along with me. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert. Cut the corners of their hair, for all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in their heart. The New Testament lesson is 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. It can be found on page 1211 of the Pew Bible and also behind me on the screen. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Jesus Christ, who became wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of God. Let us pray together. Spirit of the living God, we know you're with us here amongst us. We pray that you would fall afresh on all of us, that you would melt us, mold us, fill us, and by filling us, enable us, use us. Spirit of the living, ever-present God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Well, last week we got our series started on our first priority, Christ, another way of seeing FPC. And we talked about how it's become a challenge for many in our culture, busy, busy culture, to make what you're doing right now, church attendance, a priority. How sadly, there was a time when Sunday was viewed as a day you didn't do anything, and then it became, well, we'll do things in the afternoon, and now it's all free games, so to speak, which is a sad reality, but a reality nonetheless. We also recall the vivid story of our church's early years in the late 1700s and early 1800s, not too far from here, how they cut a path through the woods and made a commitment to worship together every Sunday. We also thought about our first pastor, Alexander Cook, who came over here from Glasgow, Scotland. He'd been a silversmith and turned to ministry later in life. And what it would have been like in those early years, even as he rode in on horseback to give the sermon in the woods. Vivid ideas about a mission field. But we concluded that not unlike 1804, we too felt like missionaries, but that the savages, unlike those times, were no longer identified by tribal markings, but that they looked a whole lot like us, just like us. People that made decisions that weren't godly, people that lived right in our same neighborhoods. So then we agreed that especially in this time, and that is what it is, a time of social and denominational, denominational confusion, that we here at First Presbyterian Church should remain faithful, faithful as we are positioned perfectly right here where we are in downtown Newcastle to impact new mission fields. At the same time, it's where we've always been, but we have the same kind of pressing mission today in this place by worshiping and serving as it is in 1 Corinthians 1.23 that we looked at especially last week, Christ and Him 
crucified. Amen? Amen. So then today we continue our focus on Jesus by being reminded God's up to something. God has a track record of calling surprising persons into his service. And further, that we can find all the confidence, the strength, if you will, that we need to face the challenges of life, whatever they are, by making Christ our first priority. Our Old Testament passage is only a a portion, it's actually the lightest portion of these words. You can go back and reread what leads up to that long directive from the prophet. But it's a portion of Jeremiah's warnings to Israel and Judah. The Apostle Paul also refers to those very words when he said, not to boast in the things of the world, but to let the one boast, who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, at first here, or at second here, or however long it's been since you've heard this, what? Sounds weird, doesn't it? At first, at first hearing and even at first reading, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Well, it sounds odd. What it does, I assure you, is that people are encouraged, encouraged rather, to boast about their faith. It's not necessarily what it means. I'm sure that all uh, remember or recall persons in their own lives that they shared their faith either with us or with friends or family members in an obnoxious way. And in that way, they were really boasting, or however they did, I don't know, before the Lord. Growing up in the church, fortunately, I was raised in the church. I've always considered myself a Christian. Now, I've had times of deepening my commitment to Christ as my Lord and Savior, certainly, but I'm a normal person who had normal ups and downs. I had, uh, I, I had my times of going astray, so to speak, because I am, was a kid, a preacher's kid, and uh, we get into trouble every now and then. But to be honest, I, not because I was going to boast in the Lord, I stayed away from the things that parents want kids to stay away from. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, and I didn't do drugs. But I didn't do that because I thought I was better than anyone. It just seemed like common sense to me. It was foolish. I liked my life. I wanted my life with my my wonderful family to continue, especially as I got older and and got involved in theater and music, I knew smoking had a direct impact on vocal cords. So it was just really foolish to me that during breaks between acts, the thespians would go out and start smoking up. I I didn't get it. But I'd never boasted about it. I just didn't do it. It just seemed like a foolish thing to do. Yet more than one person in high school, especially, made their so-called Christian virtues very public every now and then. These were not my friends, though no doubt they went to church, just like I went to church. Uh, they were, they, I didn't hang around with them. Jeremiah and Paul, boasting in the Lord means finding confidence in something, or rather specifically, someone other than yourself. It's an act of humility. And sadly, many, I'm afraid, who parade before others shouting, Jesus saves! They haven't always bothered to consider sharing the gospel, as I'd say it, 101, which is the missionary Robert Spear coined the phrase, earn the right to be heard. They just go around blatantly yelling at people, and nobody hears the salvation, the gift, the amazing grace of God in somebody who's shouting at them. I haven't always considered sharing the gospel 101. Now, there are times for blunt speech, but most of the time, I would say, faithfulness to God requires having the heart and having the ears, the heart and the ears of Jesus Christ, not the lungs or the loud mouth of John the Baptist. So, who is weak and who is strong? in the world's eyes. Consider, if you will, the difference between 
a person who's strong enough to hold their tongue and a person who publicly insults others, who is weak, who is strong in the world's eyes. Consider that difference. There's strength, isn't there, in the one who can hold their tongue and not say something versus a perf- person who snaps, so to speak. Some of the most influential men, especially men, in my life have been the strong and soft-spoken types. Strong and soft-spoken. Not the arrogant or the macho. Usually those I'm kind of embarrassed by. Who has made, I ask you to think about this morning, who has made a lasting impact on your life? How have they done this? Who are these men, these women? You might give them a call today, send them an email, text them, whatever works your form of communication. Thank them, if you can. And even if they're clinging to life, give thanks to God for them. Who is it in your life that has impacted you? Well, God has a way of calling ordinary men and women into the ministry of Jesus Christ. And most of these servants you've never heard of because they don't care that you hear of them. They go about their tasks daily, whether they're professionally called into acts of ministry or not. The future of ministry is going to look very, very different, especially in our denomination. We will need to have persons who work multiple jobs that then are given the honor and the privilege of preaching and encouraging their congregation. These ordinary persons are going to do extraordinary things, but it's absolutely in line with the very spirit that has and will continue to call them. Yet sadly, more than one of my college, and more specifically my seminary professors, don't miss this, college, I was a religion major and theater, seminary, it was masters of divinity, right? studying the Bible and the things of becoming aware of theology and ethics and the like, many of them really, really delighted in their know-it-all status. I'll never forget the time, the jarring comment that I received in my first year. Now, it wasn't from a professor, to be fair, but it was a Ph.D. student of one of my very favorite history professors, and I, while I was there studying at Princeton, there were various study labs, and I'd go down and get papers ready to print off in the lab. And I was so excited to just be a normal person, to have some common ground with somebody else. And because I liked this professor so much, I found this PhD student in the lab, and I said, oh, so-and-so, did you know that professor so-and-so, I'll leave his name nameless, but you could figure it out if you wanted to, He actually went to Westminster College, which is in western Pennsylvania. That's where I was born. My dad went there. A lot of my family's from there. I I just want to let you know. Did you know that before he came here and and did other stuff? And she looked at me without missing a beat and says, and to think what he's accomplished after such humble beginnings. Now the Grove City people think that's pretty funny. (laughs) But I, was, I felt like I was given a shot in the gut, like I was back in uh, fifth grade when I was in a soccer game and got kicked in the stomach and couldn't speak for a minute. Uh, 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 are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. That really happened. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. About this passage in 1 Corinthians, John Calvin said, Mark the end that God has in view in bestowing all things upon us in Christ, that we may not claim any merit to ourselves, but give Him all the praise. And the quote ends this way, that in us there's nothing good anywhere, but in God alone. In us there's, there's nothing good anywhere, but in God alone. Let the one who boasts, boast in God, in the Lord. So then, friends, when we prioritize the people, the places, and the things that Jesus prioritized, then we're in good company with the ones who he says in 
Matthew 5, 5, Sermon on the Mount, that we will inherit to the earth the meek. We are in good company. The humility that was evident in Jesus of Nazareth should also find its way into our very character development, even as I was talking about with the kids. Some things never change. Kids will always be challenged, but it does seem like the bullying has gotten a little bit more intense these days. And so it's important, even as they're small, that we get them ready, not to fight back, but to stand back. It's very important for all of us to think that way, too. We are in this, and if and when our own merits in this life or personal promotions become a typical, typical part of our life, then we seriously need to reconsider our motivation. If and when our own merits or our motivations behind our promotions, guess what I've done? And I took what, the, unfortunately, the PhD student said, guess what he's done? Then. Where is Westminster? Who cares about it? If we get so caught in ourselves, we've clearly not put the boast where it belongs, in God and the Lord. We've misplaced that and somehow have made it for our So many young persons these days, maybe you've found this yourself, when asked how they're doing, they just flippantly say, live in the dream. Live in the dream. The catchphrase, I'm, I'm afraid, has become synonymous with doing whatever a person wants for no other reason than because it feels good. Now, there was a whole era that did that too in the 60s. Feels good, it can't be wrong. Free love. Nowadays, it's living the dream. They're not the only ones. Slightly in the 20s, even into the early, early 30s, not 19, I'm talking about age of people, also express the same thing. Live in the dream if you ask them how they're doing, but they're talking about it as becoming financially stable. Maybe they finally have their long-term career, a house, employment, a direction in life. Either way, the reality in our mission field is this, that we face self-centered sloth and arrogance in accomplishments. So many think that they are showing strength by being brash. Live in the dream. But the truth is, they're displaying major weakness. They think they're being strong. Everything's great. They have no clue. They're displaying major weakness. I know that every era has its share of challenges, but somehow I can't hear young adults in the 1940s as they were putting their homes together, getting their first job, speaking of living the dream. Eh, just, I, don't, I don't think so. To make Christ your first priority is to work hard at whatever you're given to do for as long as God grants you the time and the energy to do it. As poet, now late, Maya Angelou said, nothing will work you do. I like that. Nothing will work unless you do. Jesus didn't flaunt his messianic mission. If anything, he downplayed it. Remember, in many parts of especially Mark's gospel, don't tell anyone about this, right? He downplayed it. He knew the message of sacrificial love and unyielding faithfulness would spread on its own merits. His disciples were given instruction to bear good fruit out of how? Their amazing ability? No. Out of the treasures of their heart. It meant out of a good place. Bear good fruit out of the good treasures in their heart. Understand this well. Bearing fruit takes time. For example, peach trees take four years to mature. Plum trees take six years to produce fruit. Yet in our American culture, into which we are called to be His light, it is notorious, this culture, for the latest, greatest fads. That's a real challenge to our priorities. 
we aim to develop healthy attitudes and actions, we must also reject the overnight sensations, the latest, the greatest, fads. Good fruit, then, understood through a biblical sense, good fruit produced by good trees, this could be a whole series, and maybe one day I'll do this, but think about this. Think about this theologically, spiritually, biblically as I say this. Good fruit produced by good trees involves knowing the climate. You can't plant an orange tree up here, right? Knowing the climate. Think of that spiritually too. Cross-pollinating. You've got to have more than one to make the fruit become producible, not just you and Jesus, as sadly a major movement became in the 80s and early 90s. Fertilization. you got to get that stuff that's teeming with life that will help produce the fruit over time. Some of our work is smelly and messy. It's worth fertilizing. Pest control. Even as the fruit is starting to grow, those darn pests appear. They get some concoction to get them off the tree. And highly significant but often forgotten, though happening naturally more and more, pruning. In a spiritual sense, I wonder if that's happening naturally to not only churches but our own denomination. Pruning is the last step. It's a long process that requires active attention and unflappable faith. But friends, there's strength in patience. Tell your neighbor, there's strength in patience. Many have heard of George Mueller's legacy in Bristol, England in the mid-1800s. He pastored a church there for more than 60 years. But what you probably remember of him is the orphans and the orphanage that he established. He never asked for financial support. And he quoted as saying in a book, Answers to Prayer, if I, a poor man, simply by prayer and faith, can obtain the means for establishing and carrying on an orphan house, hear what he said, it would be instrumental at strengthening the faith of the children of God, those were one of the people he was concerned about, strengthening the faith of the children of God, besides being a testimony to the consciences of the unconverted. He cared about everyone, even, him, even in his humble way of life. He cared about all. God has a track record of calling surprising persons into his service. Maybe that's you. How is God calling you? What is God calling you to do? In what way have you sensed the Holy Spirit moving in your life? You look back on it. Oh, I understand it now. How has God surprised you? And what persons or events have really made a lasting impact, made your faith life rich because of those events? But we all know last Thursday was the 13th anniversary of 9-11, and many persons' lives were changed on that day. Some lost their lives. Others changed careers. I'm done with this chasing the clock. I want to serve. Many increased their sympathy for first responders. I never knew how much they did or where they went or how brave they had to be. But all of us had their sense of national security re-examined. Ah, we do live in a great nation, indeed, but we are never, ever, ever safe, completely safe from evil, not this side of heaven. Tragically, evil is alive and well in the world. In one region, it goes by the name ISIS, but it isn't always recognizable especially on these shores. How have your faith commitments come into conflicts with the weakness of the world, this world, our world, our nation? If 
Oh, I'm fine. I've never come into conflict. <laughs> if it happens, you need to reexamine your priorities. You consider yourself wise according to the world's standards? If so, be forewarned, for God chooses what is foolish to shame the wise, weak to shame the strong. I have to share with you that in what I do each and every day, for many years to come, I often struggle with the trend, especially now among clergy as well as churches, to overemphasize the professionalism of the pastorate or the parish, if you will. I have a hard time with this. Market-driven strategies dominate church growth articles or books. Now, I want our church to grow as much as any of you. I do, sincerely. But like I said last week, I don't want to do this through manipulation, just telling you what you want to hear. But just as a get-rich-quick scam fails, I'm convinced that churches fail that spend more time on their branding than books of the Bible, more energy on technology than technology, and they push for a performance instead of prayer. Think about that. Now, I'm not saying that reading the Bible, knowing systematic theology, and taking time to pray is the way to church growth. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that without those three elements, alive and well, alive and well in a church's priorities, they're less likely to be growing in God-honoring ways. Because we are in Christ, in the words in verse 30 here, because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom for God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption we relate first those words to Him, and then to us. First to Him, and then to us. Strength before weakness. Again, Calvin says this in his commentary, that redemption perhaps appears last in the sentence because it's the first gift of Christ to begin in us, first gift to begin in us, and the last to be brought to completion. That's good Reformed theology. It's the first to begin in us, but the last to be brought to completion. Yet if we find ourselves becoming too enamored by thinkers, we can trip up too towards becoming like the ancient Greeks that Paul's writing to over and against, or later the Pharisees that Jesus deals with, or the Gnostics, or the New Agers, or the on and on. Those things never really change. So remember, friends, wisdom is known primarily through the one who became wisdom to us, through Jesus Christ. From an everyday viewpoint, consider, ask ourselves this, how will we determine strength or weakness? How will we determine strength or weakness? When you wake up tomorrow, what how will I determine today, this day, strength and weakness? In a world where strong athletes victimize women and children, where the poor are associated with political problems, where our nation's freedoms are easier to access for a third generation than the very first wanting their freedom for the first time, where our leaders lust for political power instead of working with others, where our television news channels cater to specific persons reporting the facts, whatever happened to that, while well, churches compete instead of working together. And most families, admit it, most families would rather accommodate their sins, I don't tell anybody about it, than face up to their needed repentance and new life in Christ Jesus. 
Friends, it's clear. It is clear in many, many ways that Jesus Christ has work yet to be done through our hands and feet right here in downtown Newcastle. Amen? Amen. The world we live in is hostile to Him. Don't kid yourselves. It is. But that's exactly why it's a good mission field. Exactly why. Because Jesus calls, we are willing to be seen as fools for His sake. Because Jesus calls, we know that worldly wisdom will disappoint us. Because Jesus calls, we embrace the other as His unfinished work of redemption. Because Jesus calls, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Oh, it's a stumbling block to some, yes. But to those who are called, it is worth making our very first priority. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Before we go to God in prayer, I wanted to share with you, if you didn't hear, that our beloved Marge Good Pastor passed on last Friday, and the visitation hours will be Tuesday from 4 to 8 at Cunningham's, and then we'll have a service here on Wednesday at 11 o'clock. She will be sorely missed, and I'm sure you'll think of her around Christmas time. Let's pray together.
Heavenly Father, you call us. You call us into a world that needs you. And yet all of us, by being given the calling, do not respond. In only your own wisdom, in only having your own understanding, would we get it. Help us be so concerned about who gets it and who doesn't. That we open fingers instead of open hands. That we yell that they need to be saved instead of teaching them a life of Christ. Help us not to get too wrapped up in our own everyday activities to miss the amazing gifts that are from you. The beauty of this creation here in western Pennsylvania. Even as we turn from summer to fall, our best season here. Help us not to think, oh gee, here comes winter but to think, thank God for the beauty of this time of autumn. We pray for those in other churches as well as our own who are in positions of leadership, our denomination as well as others who are struggling to remain faithful despite all the competing voices they hear for becoming relevant or watering down their theology, or just caring about something other than maintaining their institution. Your wisdom alone, Lord Jesus, will guide us collectively. We who are a part of your kingdom here on this earth, that you have created and that you have redeemed. We pray for those who hurt. We think about the good pastor family, especially as they lost their beloved matriarch, who even at the ripe old age of 65 began the new career of having that Christmas house out in the woods, giving us cheer all year long with her her beautiful smile and her loveliness. We pray that you'd be with her daughter and her son and with all those who will miss her. We pray for all of those who are hurting today, physically or emotionally, spiritually, mentally. For those who are concerned about something even yet today, give them calm and resolve to face whatever their challenges are with wisdom, with your strength, and not with weakness of anxiety. We pray prayers of thanksgiving for those who are feeling better today, for those whose outlook has changed for the good, for despite the challenges of life that they've faced, that they're overcoming things, that they're maintaining their mission, that they're doing it just as you would have them do it most of the time. We pray that our charge would continue to be the same, to be your disciples to be His light here in Newcastle, to love others unconditionally, but also calling them to accountability. We pray all of this in the name of the One who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
ask yourselves, even today, what's strong? Well, there may be some moments today where you need your physical strength. No doubt. Thanks be to God, you have the strength to get here. Some of us just need that strength to get out of bed. But what's strong? What does God want me to do that's strong for His sake? Great things for Him that I can do. And what's weak? Even if I'm physically able, what do I not need to do? Not need to say, what do I need to allow the wisdom to refrain from? This is an ongoing question, but I pray that at least today and this upcoming week, that as you consider the many com- comp- competing rather voices for your time, your energy, your thoughts, that you'd prioritize what Jesus Christ wants of you, that you would be strong for His sake and not weak, but that in a moment you may be used, though others may see you as weak, to humble the strong. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you today and every day. Amen.